Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning and welcome. Um, personally, I am so glad to see all of you. I'm glad we had this opportunity to come together. Um, there were a relatively small group of residents that, when the little increase letters went out, uh, initially expressed some concerns, some questions. And so what we quickly realized was it was worth having a group meeting to try to address those. We anticipated about 30 people in total. As it stands right now, we've got about 120 people that will be at this meeting and the one this afternoon. So this morning's meeting is for Lakeside residents. Welcome to Lakeside residents. We're glad to have you here. Um, before we get started, I've asked Pastor Leslie uh, to give us a brief devotion. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our reading today comes from Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This verse from Lamentations reminds us of God's unfailing love and mercy. God's goodness that sustains us and keeps us mindful of what we do and who we respond to and how we respond to the things in our lives that cause us difficulty. Mercy is something we don't talk about very often, but it is a necessary part of our lives. It reminds us of kindness and generosity, cooperation, forgiveness, and giving. It keeps us mindful of how we respond and how we treat one another, too. Mercy was the topic of our worship this week in the Health Center. Kristen, one of our resident engagement staff, told the story of her son when he was about six years old. Apparently, he had done something that was unacceptable in their household, and Kristen said to him, you cannot have dessert tonight. Her son immediately broke down crying and said, but mom, where is the mercy? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. McElberry says that there is always to be mercy. Kristen shared that this outcry from her son changed her discipline to show him that, yes, indeed, mercy is a good thing. We are living in a time when mercy doesn't take the lead. Indeed, we are exposed to the opposite of mercy, aren't we? We see all manner of negative messages in our world, and we are left bereft from the negative outcome of most situations. Our world is hurting, and we are hurting along with it. This scripture from Lamentation speaks to us of the love we have from God, calling it steadfast, and reminding us that God's mercies never come to an end. It says they are new every morning. This gives us courage. It lets us know that we are not alone in our daily living, that God's presence in our lives is constant not fleeting, and that with this promise we are strengthened to do the work that God calls us to do with a sense of deep cooperation, integrity, and compassion. Let us pray. God of mercy, love, and compassion, you come to us with mercies that arrive to us new each and every morning. Your presence in our lives sustains us Give, we give thanks for the ways you make yourself known to us. Be with us as we gather today. Your mercy sustains us. For this and so much more, we give you thanks. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. Um, two things. One is, I want to thank you all for compliance with the restrictions we have today. Part of the reason we have restrictions is that this represents the first time that a large group like this has come together at the Hearthstone, other than in our dining room. The dining room is different, small groups of two or four, and the tables are spread out. But we're in a fairly close environment here. We expect close to 60 people, so we've asked you to keep your mask on. Thank you very much. We've also asked you to honor the seating positions that we have. We're trying to build in a certain degree of uh, social distancing, so thank you for doing that. Um, I think this is 
kind of a, a historic meeting for the Hearthstone that we are able to get this many people together. Unless things change, I suspect this will be the new normal when it comes to meetings. Um, we still don't yet know how we'll do the resident council meetings. That, that Everybody's invited um, to attend. If all the resident bodies are invited to attend, we can have 100 or more. This room will hold 100 or more using this type of, um, of, of social distancing. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll see what we can do in terms of that particular meeting. I know Reese and I have been talking about whether or not we can have that ready for next week, I think, or something. So, um, I'll also add that um, you will find I'll lose track in my own head. So I'm, I know none of you can relate. Sometimes I can't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I think we do the light, Ariana, if you've got some feeding in the back or any other late numbers. And again, I'm sorry we're 10 minutes late. We'll allow for that. We do want to keep this meeting to an hour. Um, I'll go through a quick agenda here in a second. First and foremost, uh, we'll go through introductions, not only those that will be a part of the meeting, but also uh, kind of introducing the topic uh, that we'll be talking about. Uh, the general information we have to share starts with an overview of our current financial situation at the Hearthstone, kind of a high level overview, but still something to give you a basis from which uh, you know you can build an understanding of what we're doing. The second thing, second main area we'll talk about is our solution to that situation. Then we'll look at um, the, how we develop market prices. And when you hear the word market, think about people that don't live here, people that are coming in from the outside, uh, new residents, essentially. Um, we develop rates for, for what we advertise, so to speak, what Jill uses in her work with people that are interested in moving here. Then we'll talk about how we develop the rate increase all of you and, and for those at the code building. So the point being is that that's different. We set market rates and then we looked at what we'll call variance. So you're going to hear that word over and over uh, as we talk about the difference between what we're uh, what we're advertising and charging the new residents and what you all are currently paying. And then lastly at the end, hopefully we'll have time. There'll be a few closing comments and then that's the point in time we'll try to take questions bring up the house lights, we have a microphone, I'll ask that you raise your hands and you know, we'll, we'll get to as many as we can, again trying to keep our overall time frame at an hour. I do have one request with regard to questions. Our preference is that our questions, your questions, are specific to the topic today. So anything we share with you that you have a question about, I saw several people with laptops, iPads, pen and paper, just make a note as we go because we can come back to any slide that you see and talk more specifically if you have a question about that information. What we are not going to be able to do is have an open forum, kind of like we had at our last resident council meeting, where we're going to be talking about anything and everything, concerns, complaints, whatever the case may be. We'd really like to keep this meeting to the general topic of the monthly fee increases that started in January. <coughs> so essentially we, we worked on a theme for this meeting. And basically, we want to work together with you to ensure the Hearthstone is here for many years to come. Those of you that heard me speak in front of a group since I came in November of 21, you likely heard me say, and I've said this over and over again, and I think if you talk to any of the Board of Trustees, they will agree with the fact that I was essentially selected here based on my background and experience. Um, and by the way, I did not introduce myself. My name's coming up in a second, but I'm Reggie. I'm, I'm the CEO <laughs> here. Sorry. Uh, I can't assume everybody knows that. Some of you may not have met me or seen me here. Uh, my office is at the end of the hall right across from reception. You go down that hall to the last floor on the right. Usually if I say
say next to Jill's office, everybody knows what Jill's office is. Um, but you, you, you likely heard me say it, you've heard me speak. The primary purpose I was given in coming here was to ensure the long-term sustainability of this organization, meaning that we've been here more than 60 years. I would like to know that 60 years from now, when none of us other than maybe Ariana and Hallie are still around, um, <laughs> I'd like to know that people look back on this period of time, my tenure here, however, however long it might last, but they look back and, and they say, you know, well, that Mullis guy didn't mess it up any worse than it already was, that kind of thing. They might not say he's he was the hero that saved but I just want to go down in history as doing my best to ensure this community is here long term. Each of you, when you paid an interest fee to come here, had an expectation that the Hearthstone would be here for as long as you need the organization. What you'll hear today is we are not, have not been on a track to ensure that long-term sustainability. The core of long-term sustainability is financial stability, and I think that's what this slide says. The purpose of today's meeting is to share with you uh, an in-depth look into our current situation, the challenges that we're facing as an organization, and then the, the responses that we've developed to those challenges, um, with the goal of being to achieve a, a, a better fiscal balance. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And to try to do that during a, an unprecedented period of time. And you'll see some of the slides today with what is happening primarily in the labor market, what is happening with the cost of supplies and other items that we have to purchase here. That all is underlying with, with what we're doing. So let me introduce those that will be participating in the meeting. First and foremost, Lee Coors, who is the chairman, the current chairman of our board of trustees. Uh, Lee was very much involved with other board members in making the decision to, to call me to be your CEO. He's here with us today. You may not be able to see him. I put him in the dark, not for a reason. Right over here in the corner. Right over here in the corner. <laughs> I will tell you, I'm almost sure he's the biggest guy in the room, but I, I, that's not going to be true. We have a couple of really tall guys here. But, uh, if I end up in a fight, I would like to have I would like to have uh, I've already mentioned that I'm the CEO. Uh, Jack McKittrick is our chief financial officer. Uh, he's on stage. He'll be at the podium here in a second. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Jack was brought on uh, very early on after the last change from the full-time CEO that was here. That's not Ias Sapar. I was an interim, but when the former CEO left, uh, soon thereafter, Jack was brought in to help sort of stabilize our About a year after that, this was last summer, um, I talked with the board. They agreed we asked Jack to become a permanent employee, not permanent, but a, an employee of the organization. Uh, Jack does live in St. Louis, Missouri, um, so he is here on, on occasion, almost always at least once a month. Uh, he's been here twice in the last three weeks, so um, uh, those of you that know Chateau, our controller, she is out on maternity leave. and. Um, so, you know, Jack's spending more time here. It is his responsibility to ensure, you know, the ongoing uh, uh, appropriateness of our accounting and our financial statements and all the reporting we do to the various agencies. Also up here with us today is Jill Boltman. Uh, I think, did I bring this up on the right side? Did I do that? Oh, Allie's touching something back there. She's bringing this up. Um, I keep my finger off the trigger. Maybe that'll work. But um, Jill is our director of sales. Uh, as I said, our office Jill is here mainly to represent uh, some of the uh, content that went into our decision making um, as we look to uh, do the two things we've done, which is the market analysis, the resetting of prices last year, and then the variance analysis we did to determine the rate increases that we fortunately had to pass on to residents this year. So we have learned much more about that. I do want to share one thing with Jill. I said yesterday, I'm sorry. We're talking about, again, the purpose of this meeting. And if you know this phrase, it'll be funny. If not, you won't know what I'm talking about. But basically, we want to show you how the sausage is made. Okay, So th 
just let you inside a little bit of, of what we've done in the past. And based on that, I need to make an apology. Okay? My fault. The letter that I sent out did not include any information about why we needed to raise our rates. And I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's been done here in the past. We've only found one letter that was issued before uh, Jack and I got here. Um, and then it was you know, just sort of generic, you know, our costs are going up, our labor's going up, that kind of thing. But I realize now I probably should have given you a good page of information, the same kind of stuff we pulled together and put into this report. And there's no excuse for that. I'm sorry for that. The timeline between the point that uh, Jack and I were ultimately able to do an analysis of the variance, and you'll hear that word quite often, um, and the time that we needed to notify all of you for the January 1st rent increase, that was a very short period of time. It got even shorter because that was a very complicated process of issuing those letters. Each of you got a letter that had about six unique things on that one letter. So we didn't make copies and send everybody the same letter. It had your current rate, it had new rate, the variance between you know, what, what your apartment could sell for today, those kinds of things. We, I focused on the fact that I wanted you to understand why we took a variance approach to setting uh, your increase. I failed to say why, and I apologize. So Jack's going to come up and talk about our current economic condition. Um, those things are factors for us here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Sure, I'm not as a good quality speaker as Reggie is. So, um, all right. Uh, once again, I'm Jack McKittrick. I'm the Chief Financial Officer, um, and I'll go over a few slides here about the current uh, economic condition. Uh, financial stability overview. Uh, financial stability is only obtained through a balance of revenue and cost. Um, the cost of operating the Hearthstone has been increasing significantly in recent years. As evidence is increases in the labor and operating expenses. Um, this report here is basically our audited 2018 through 2021 financial statements. First graph. Right here, this is the net worth of the company. Uh, so, as you can see, our net assets are kept growing up from 2018 to 2020, but then they started to go down in 2020 to 21. We have a dotted line that kind of shows this going up, but with 2021 and 2022, uh, that line is going to start to that dotted line is going to start to go down uh, just because our net assets, the net worth of the company, has been decreasing over the last few years. Current assets. I was just going to say, we would have 2022 on there, but we have not closed our books for last year, nor do we have an audited number that we can add to this to this particular side. But I'll just reemphasize what he said. Not only are we going to see in both of these charts a continued downward slide, but if you'll notice the dotted line, that's a trend line if you've ever built a spreadsheet. When we dropped in some numbers just as, as placeholders for what 22 might end up looking like for both net assets and current assets, um, what we saw is that trend line really began to go south. It really began to go downhill. So we, we are smart enough to project and forecast kind of what's coming. We can see this is history. These are audited financial numbers. But we also kind of know that there's more to come in terms of the decline of the finances of the organization. So our next, whoops, our next chart here is the current assets. Um, and you can see we are sitting at around 15 million up to about just under 17 million, but we slowly decreased over the last two years. Uh, and uh, a good majority of that is you know, our investments that we've had in 2022. We probably had a decline of around 20 to 25 percent of our market value of our investment um, yeah. in there. So, moving on to our next slide, this is as 
slide uh, that was. Uh, Oh, sorry. This is a slide here of uh, the national survey that uh, Ziegler Capital did. Ziegler did a survey of CCRCs uh, in 2022 towards the end about uh, basically a key driver through uh, the industry for all CCRCs. So these are the primary uh, predictors for fee increases that this survey reached out to. As you can see, the first one, wages and labor, it had 186 mentions. This is one of the primary reasons for rate increases. Inflation, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, is another core, and then food costs. So, um, labor. This is the Seattle minimum wage. As you can see, Seattle minimum wage has increased from 2017 all the way through 2023. Um, roughly about 30% over five years. Um, the minimum wage, this increase has caused pushes on other wages as well, uh, as you look through this. So I just wanted to kind of push that there. Maybe you have anything to add? Just that, you know, in addition to looking at national surveys and talking with other organizations like ours, I thought it was important from a granular standpoint for you to understand what's really driving wages here in the Seattle market. Because we can't afford to get people from outside the market, you know, they they might make more by driving here, but you won't get people to commute like that. So, you know, that 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 trend, um, and, and I'm not making a judgment, this is not a political uh, statement, but that has affected every business in the Seattle area that employs people. Um, and as Jack mentioned, it's not just about, you know, minimum wage. Minimum wage is the jumping off point for every other salary, uh, you know, in the organization. Everything is relevant This is the next slide here is the consumer price index. Um, as you can see, uh, from 2020 to 2022, uh, we were just below one. Um, and as we moved up through uh, the end of 2022, that has gone up to about nine. And I think if you guys have read the news, uh, you can see why inflation is going up, why the Fed has been raising interest rates, because they're trying to fight inflation and bring those numbers down. And, that, and just to be clear, about that's, that, these are national numbers. Next slide is uh, from the survey again from Ziegler uh, that we did, and it's a national trend for uh, not for profits for senior living. Um, this, the bottom line here is the, whoops, sorry, sorry. The bottom line here is the averages. You can see the average from 2014 through 2020 was around three to percent. 2021, the average is starting to uptick in 2022 and in 2023, four to seven. This is a national. This is across the, the nation. Uh, See where the minimum up here was all zeros until we kind of get to here. The maximum was around five to six percent, and then the last two years it's gone up to twelve to fifteen and a twelve uh, from here. Seattle and the West Coast is kind of on the third quartile when it comes to some of the data that they have um, as cost per percent. Uh, as you can see, the third quartile is around three and a half percent, but then it starts to go up in twenty two and twenty. Just that I know this is a lot of information, but like he just said, that third quartile, and, and I would argue that we may literally be in the fourth quartile um, because of what minimum wage is done. We have literally, I think, the highest minimum wage in the United States. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But I was reading as we developed this, and that minimum wage is driving everything. So I would suggest we're at least in the third quartile, if not higher than that. So for 23, all of these communities that were surveyed by Ziegler average for all of their residents 6.9%. That's an important number that will come up later. Minimum wage compared to St. Louis, Seattle is double, to give you perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Minimum wage in St. Louis, Missouri uh, versus Seattle, uh, Seattle's practically double of what St. Louis is. St. Louis is around 9.5%. Oh, I do have one thing to add. When I was at the conference for CFOs for Zieglers, they did have a poll of this was back in last April, what raises were going to our increases were going to be. And they one of the questions they just did, raise your hand, um, how many CFOs do they plan to do a five percent increase or more? And I'd say about ninety percent of the people in the room raised their hand just because of the 
talk and the discussions about some of the increasing costs that you can see um, in some of the different So, in an effort to try to understand the history here, I'll talk a little more about that in a second, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that um, the, car, the car stone, over the course of the last 10 years, we'll say, has issued rate increases that have ranged from about 3% to about 10%. Issuing rate increases to some residents of 10%, which we did this year, is a little bit unprecedented. I used that word early on in our discussion because I believe we are, Jack and I believe, we are in unprecedented times when it comes to our costs, particularly labor. So the reason for the question marks is that we, we and I'm not faulting anyone, but we don't have very good information with regard to what's been done here. In fact, in fact to, to get those, um, to get those Three, four, five, six, seven, those numbers, we actually had to do some random sampling of residents' um, accounts. If you pull up your account with historic information for 10 years, we can see the fees change from December to January, and we can calculate that percentage. So that's how we know there were, there were increases given. Obviously, I know we gave a 5% increase last year. But because we really haven't been able to understand what, what's been done, all we know for a fact is there were these flat rate increases, meaning that for the most part, everybody got the same increase. And I get it. I, I, you could probably argue to say that's fair, that everybody gets an increase. This presentation is hopefully going to help you understand, again, how we make the sausage, why we had to address that issue of not continuing flat rate increases. But just to give you just a simple uh, example of why that has been problematic this year. We were trying to achieve, and we'll see more about this in a minute, but we're trying to achieve a 7.5% average increase across the board. So I could have given everybody here and everybody at the coast a 7.5% increase. In doing so, some people would have actually moved above market price, and that didn't feel fair or equitable. So we did have to look at a balance why we ended up doing, and I said this in the letter, some people at five, some at seven and a half, and some at six. The other thing that we can't really determine, but we see no evidence of it, is that there's ever been a market rate analysis done here at the Hearthstone. Um, Ariana's been here for seven years. She's been a part of sales and marketing. Um, when I began to do this, when I began to do this uh, a year ago, to look at where our prices were as compared to uh, other organizations that provide similar products or similar apartments like we do. Um, I, we, we, go, we went through a complex process. I'm going to show you every step of that in a second. But what I want you to understand is we didn't see any evidence that had ever been done in the past. I'm not saying that was a bad thing. I'm not passing judgment. But I will tell you, I'm in my 26th year in this industry. I've never worked anywhere that did not perform an annual comparison of, of an organization's pro, uh, prices to the rest of their competitive market. That's just a given. If you try to run a business and you don't pay attention to what your competitors are doing, you may not be in business very long. You can set your prices too low, or you get consumed by your expenses and, and your costs go up, or you set your prices too high and nobody takes your product. So it is a careful balance. It starts with a good market analysis. The second analysis we'll talk about will have a different description. It's the variance, the analysis of the variance between what current residents are paying and what we are charging for new incoming residents. That variance is what drove the, the increases that we did last month. guy is supposed to look upset. Okay. So in operating a business, 
And we are a business. We are not for profit. And we are not trying to make a profit. I, I coined the phrase during a board meeting that now one of the board members floods quite often is we are not a for loss organization. You hear me say we're not a for loss. We're not for profit. Um, and, and there's a big difference. We didn't we don't come to work, you didn't move in here to watch this organization continue its downhill decline. We want to get to a break-even point. We're not trying to make any money, we just want to break even. That's what nonprofits are supposed to do. So, um, so there's only really two things you can do in a business. I'm sure many of you ran businesses, worked for businesses, but at the end of the day, you got two things that you can possibly control. One of those is cost, expenses. In working with a team, with Jack, we believe we've made some positive improvements to our overall cost here at the Hearthstone. We've tried to do those where they had no impact on you. So some of you would argue various potential parts of that. And I'll, I'll volunteer things like we went from two drivers to one driver. Um, and we're not going to talk about that today, but I'll tell you this. When I got here, you've been without a second driver for two years. And instead of hiring a second driver, we now have a resident engagement team. And there'll be an announcement coming out this week. I'm sorry, we missed last week. I was out of town for four days. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we have instead asked our resident engagement team, Lance's team, and, and by the way, he now has a full team of seven people. We've asked them all to be approved and recorded as appropriate drivers. And so what you're going to see happen, you see happen is Jeff's role will be solely for medical appointments and what I like to call concierge driving, where, where you've said, I'd really like to go to Walmart or, or Target or whatever. You make arrangements with him and he takes you. All of the other driving for events, outings, restaurants, movies, wherever we, the, the resident engagement team might decide to take a group of residents, that driving will be performed by that team. So we, we went from two drivers down to one, and now we're up to eight. We want to be sure everybody understands we have made sure we have people that can drive our people. Okay, so this guy. So, so anyway, to finish this up. You can reduce costs. I, we, I could have come in here and slashed the expenses. I really could have. That, that's no way to do business. That's not fair to all of you. It's not what you signed on for when you came here. So if we start cutting costs or reducing expenses, or as Lee and I were talking this morning, trying to operate more efficiently by controlling costs, that could lead to a face like this guy has. Because you might feel that. You might feel reduction in the availability of services, you might feel um, you know, a reduction in the quality of services, and, and I don't stand here and pretend that everything we do is perfect. We still have a lot of work to do, okay? We do. Somebody reminded me yesterday, we've been here a year, well, if you see the list of things that we accomplished last year, I think you, you probably give a little allowance for that. Regardless, the other thing you can do is try to improve your revenue. That's the two pieces, cost and revenue. And so what we chose to do was take a hard look at what those things we could do to improve our revenue. That includes two things. One is we raised our market rate a year ago. And then the second thing is when we came time to look at increases for residents this year, we knew we had to push the envelope. You saw the slide from Ziegler. We are not the only ones that are pushing uh, and trying to grow our rates for our existing residents. It is a thing, it, it literally happens every year, except in a really great economy where we go, you know what, we don't need to increase rates this year. That might happen in the future. I, I just honestly don't know. The primary way in which to increase revenue is to adjust pricing on our part. So this guy. So if you start with the fact that there's, there is a question about the financial stability of this organization, I don't think I would have been hired otherwise, quite frankly. And then you add to that, you know, these rapidly growing prices like labor. And, and as you saw from the Consumer Price Index, all of the other increases, food, utilities, supplies, et cetera, all of these things are driving up costs. You add those two things together, and you operate in a sense of, we really, I love that red X, we really want to avoid impacting the quality and availability of services. Not been my 
my intention now or anyone else on the team, not been our intention now or in the future to reduce those things that you deserve to have as a resident of the Hearthstone. Examples of that are the salon, or the bistro, a gift shop, the artwork in the dining room. These were all things that we believe that you deserve and should have. And I've made my mission last year to get as much of that done as possible. I'm not taking a bow. I'm not a hero. I'm just saying that was what was important to us. We have more to do. We want to do some remodeling in our memory care and assisted living areas. We are thinking about doing some remodeling downstairs. And yes, we will involve residents in that process. But I can't ask 150 people what they think it should look like until I've got 150 different answers. But you add those three things together, what you get is the need for additional residents. That, that's my simple equation of kind of why we're here today. That's got to take some work. First part of the puzzle then, where we need to, we know we need to increase revenue, is adjusting our market rate. That is the rate we charge to the darker here. Oh, the slide's dark. That's what it takes.
can't see Jill, she's not in my head. She's at the front line, she knows how and why people are making decisions about where they choose to move. But then we looked at you know, the differences. First thing is location. We couldn't find anybody else in our market group that overlooked Green Lake. <laughs> and I know for some of you, that's a big deal. Not just whether or not you can see it from your apartment, but it's there. It is a great resource for walking, for exercise, for beauty, for nature, to see kids playing, to see geese laying. Not really. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, Green Lake is a tremendous asset. And you know, our predecessors, our forefathers, as, as it were, you know, they chose this location wisely. And it does make a difference. So, yeah, if you compare us to one of the others that's downtown Seattle, some would say, well, yeah, it's downtown Seattle. You know, it's near everything. I would say there is nowhere to park. It is hard to get in and out of there. It is, feels like somewhat of a combat zone. I think that was Jill's term. So there are pros and cons. All these things weigh into our decision. The next thing we looked at is, is the amenities, the common areas, the spaces that are provided. I know one of these in the group has a beautiful um, uh, uh, concert hall, if you will. That's great. Our, our forefathers didn't just, you know, they chose not to build something. Chapel? Some of them don't have chapel. And we have this great area downstairs. We have a beautiful, now I think, a beautiful dining room. And so it's those things that make up the amenities of the community as we compare them. We look at the current condition of the building. And I will tell you, that's, that's where the hearthstone, we had to make adjustments from a negative standpoint for the hearthstone. This is a 60 plus year old building. I told somebody one day, the elevators were acting up, which seemed like every day. But we, were doing, we, you know, we made some changes. I don't, I don't want to get off track, but the reality is I, I made a comment that the elevators are almost the same age as I am. So, <laughs> yeah. There are days when I don't want to go either. You know, I just, <laughs> I just soon sit. You know. um, the other thing we looked at was the specific services that they offered as compared to us. They may offer more, they may offer less than us. Not every community has a member care unit. And then we also looked at the actual age of the building. Some people want to be in brand new, shiny, beautiful towers. Some people like, I'll call it, the warmth of the hearthstone. Okay? And some of that is because we've been here 60 years. And, and those that founded this organization, their heart was in the right place. We never lose sight of that. Okay? And then lastly, the ultimate comparison. Once we adjusted pricing between us and these competitors, ups, downs, in between, we, we leveled the playing field, then the ultimate comparison was we did pricing on a square foot basis. So a 336 square foot studio, when you do the math on that, we came down to a dollar amount per month per square foot. And we looked at that across the board. Same with one bedroom, same with two bedrooms. Now we look at So, a couple of points. And it's okay if you don't remember. I sent you all a letter about a year ago when we increased prices the last year. That was where everybody got a 5 If you've got an increase, you got a 5% increase. And I say if you've got an increase because some people had moved in in a, in a few months that preceded that. And I inherently believe that it's just not right to move somebody in and in six months increase their rent. Okay. So we try to avoid that where it was possible. But in that letter, there was a statement about the fact that we had um, you know, done our market analysis, what I just showed you, and we realized that our rates were somewhere between 10 and 20 percent lower than the rest of the folks in that group. This group. 10 to 15 Sorry, I'm looking up there with the That's not right. 15 to 20 percent. That's what that letter said. When we did the analysis. The end result was we were 15 to 20 percent lower than everybody else. So we adjusted our rates. We did not raise our rates 15, I mean, or 20 percent. I think we raised them on average somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. But the rates that we showed the public, we raised.
Once we allow for the differences between us and the others in the competitive market, um, we set our rates for this year. And that, and, and that was the beginning of, in my mind, a new era here in terms of trying to achieve financial stability and long-term sustainability for the organization. Those went into effect last March, I think. I think we sent letters like at the end of January and then we went into effect in March. We got two months of no change, but we did have to adjust, adjust rates. You all got 5% if you were here, but we adjusted market rates around 15%, somewhere in that zone, I think it was 15%. And this is what's important. That market analysis that we did, that I just walked you through, that didn't have any effect on your increases last year. That 5% was based on where we thought our budget would be, what, had, what we could determine had been done historically here. And I said in that letter that it was not my intention to put that gap, that 15 to 20 percent gap between us and other competitors, I didn't want to put that on the backs of our residents. Okay? That's not the purpose here. And then lastly, I want folks to understand that the rates Jill and I developed that we have used now for a year. They have been tested. When I say tested, that means that we've determined that we've gotten zero resistance to those rates. That people have looked at the Hearthstone, looked elsewhere. The newly established 2022 market rates have held. They've held, and, and they, you know, we've not. We're not getting anybody. Pushing back, saying, you know, that's too high. Jill will start nodding her head in a second. She's talked to many, many people. Some moved in, some haven't, but it was never about the monthly cost. Okay. So that's how we know those rates, generally speaking, those rates are appropriate. And I, I would I would hold those up to anybody and have them challenge me otherwise. Okay, so I'm gonna have Jack come in and talk to you about the next part of the process, <coughs> which is how we came to determine various amounts of increases that were provided. Again, as I said, some got 5%, some got 7.5%, some got 10%. This is what we call the variance uh, market approach. Um, what did I call it? Variance. Various model, sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. I'm stuck on model. Um, and that is what I'm, I'm accustomed to, right or wrong. It's what everybody else in the industry has done. The market, they look at the competitors, they establish market rates for the new incoming uh, residents. Then they take a look at what residents are paying. That gap, that's called the variance. Jack's going to go into more detail about that. Okay. Okay. as well. 
looked at my watch and we are right at an hour, but I had said we'd allow for the 10 minutes and kind of took them to get going. And I'm going to wrap up quickly, I promise. So, um, you know, as, as we seek to sort of bring this, all of these ideas together, these are the primary points I want to try to have you at least consider, if not understand. developed the budget for this year, for 2023. We worked with and ultimately presented to that budget to the finance committee of our board of trustees. We recommended that we use that information and that that be our guide for this year. And I will tell you that budget is a much better, uh, tighter uh, tool for us than the one we had last year. I wasn't even really here. When I came in November, no budget had I didn't even know where the restrooms were. I couldn't make really educated you know, guesses. I, with Jack and I together, we came up with a budget for this year. And we've been using it, but not to the extent we will this year. I'm sorry, the budget for last year, it was a guide. But this year, it, it's a tool. And the managers here know that. The expectation is that they will be at or below budget for the cost they've been provided. We did not make serious cuts in that budget anywhere that we felt like would affect you. That's, that's important for you to remember. That budget, uh, after it was presented to the Board of Trustees, and it included an average rental rate increase of 7.5%. A little bit unprecedented. Again, we found evidence of a 7% increase uh, in a prior year, three, four years ago. We were asking for a 7% increase. The board, at least here you could ask them, they unanimously approved that budget with a 7.5% average increase. I'm not passing the buck here. I just want you to know, we're not making this up. We're not going rogue. We are working very closely with the board of trustees of this organization, whose purpose it is to ensure that this organization is here in another 60 years. Lastly, kind of interesting. At the end of the day, when we looked at all of the residents, all of the existing residents of this community, and the increases they got, the average was actually below 7.5%. It came in at 6.7%. We'll call it 6.7%. That, that's where we hit. And I know some of you are not happy with 10% increases. I understand that. I know some of you are worried we'll give you a 10% increase for the next few years so we get you to market price. That is not the plan. In fact, I'm sure one of the questions that's waiting is, am I going to get a 10% increase next year? And I can go ahead and answer that for you. We don't know. We don't know what the cost of labor is going to be. We don't know what you know the cost of everything else in this organization is going to do. We just don't know. We don't know if our market rates will go up. Jill and I will take another look mid-year. We'll determine if we need to increase rates to outside individuals for next year. If we do, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll need to excessively increase your rates next year. The purpose of this was driven from a financial standpoint, but at the heart of it was this idea of building a little better equity among the various that live here. Now, we didn't pick on this building. We didn't pick on one of the code buildings. This is across the board. As Jack showed you, we looked at how far people were from market rate. And understand we use market rate because that's all we had. We established good market rates. We tested them for a year. Jill tested them over and over again without resistance. And then at the end of the day, that became our benchmark. Our purpose was not to get everybody to it. Our purpose was close the gap and level the differences, the variances among all of the residents. Okay, so at this point, and I'm sorry, we only have about five minutes or so. I'm, again, I'm trying to stick to the original hour, so we were 10 minutes late starting. If you need to go, you certainly can go. You don't have to stay. If you have a question for me, for Jack, for Jill, or for Lee, we have microphones for you. I have a question, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Stephen has a mic he will bring to you. Got one over here. And we'll
we'll wait for that microphone before you say the question. We like for everybody to hear. Oh, I can't. Sorry, Sorry Don is behind a column. I can't see. And then we'll come to you, I promise. Okay. You want Don. me to stand? That That's up to you. We can hear you. Um, so, I think probably from a, from a resident's point of view, the concern that I have probably all of us have is if, if it is necessary to continue to raise our uh, monthly fees at that level, uh, um, all of us did hopefully a financial analysis before we moved in here. We did a financial analysis. No, I mean each of us. Right. Plus we did one for you to okay. be sure. Okay. That's right. You did. Right. And um, and uh, with consultation for, for, from our own financial advisors, we say, well, how long can I live here? Because everybody, everybody in this room worries about, will I out lose my money? Of course. And so, um, if we are, if our if our uh, uh, annual increases are at a six or seven. Likely to outlive our money. And so the ultimate impact on the Hearthstone is that you will find it very hard to live up to that commitment, uh, whether it's uh, uh, stated, uh, uh, written, or verbal, that we won't kick you out if you run out of money. You will, you will have a home here until you die. Right. That is. That is So I think that's, I, I think I represent both, both concerns. That's the ultimate anxiety from the residents of both of you. And I, so they, yeah. And then, but the, so the question out of that is, where are you in your, in your level of confidence that you have addressed this issue of uh, relative fairness of uh, fees That's an excellent question, and, and thank you for that, Don. That, um, I actually forgot to sign. It's going to be just a minute while I respond, but I promise we will come to you with that. Um, so, I actually meant to talk about this, and I'm going to start by saying this word. Congratulations. The decision you made to be a part of the Hearthstone, and to speak to what Don just said, unless something changes in the future, certainly not going to happen during my tenure, write that down. The Hearthstone is committed to not asking or requiring any residents of Lee because of financial reasons. That's in that's on our website. It's in our material. That comes from our board of directors and that comes from 60 years of history. So while I can't tell you not to worry about outliving your money, as long as you live in the Hearthstone, that will not be an issue. Okay? So not a reason to say don't worry, it's just the fact that we have a resident assistance program. I'm not sure you'll find that at all five of those competitors. I know at least one that has, has that opportunity. We have about it's either five or six people that are currently on resident assistance. You don't know who they are, you shouldn't know who they are. We know who they are. We subsidize rent for those individuals, we do so confidentially and quietly, and we make sure they have a home. Trying to get you to understand that you should feel good about the choice you made to be at the heart of Let me add one little caveat to that, because this has happened. There is a reason you might not be able to continue to live at the heart stone, and that is simply because we have reached a level of care, and I won't ask Rosie to do it now, but you can talk to Rosie about this. If you have a condition that we are not appropriately staffed, trained, or to provide. And most of the time that falls in the area of behavioral change. If you can't, if your behavior is such that you can't exist in a group of residents, for instance in our memory care, 
that's problematic for other residents, problematic for staff, it could even be problematic for the individual resident themselves. In those situations, we're going through one right now, we have, we have done everything we can to help that family find appropriate care and to try to leave a lifeline connected between them and this organization so that when and if they were able to come back to the community, typically that would be into the health center, typically it would be where behavioral issues or, or really heavy, intense medical issues that we're not licensed to cover. We want them to be able to come back here in the final stages of their life. That's a promise we make. And to have accessibility to that res to that residence in this program in the community. So this, these are all things that we think about and we've mapped into this. But um, really to address Don's comment is I can't, I can't help that you be nervous. I get it. But I can tell you that the day we don't have any plans for these 10% increases to anybody, even if those individuals that were 40% below market, right, we gave them only a 10%. It's not likely we will do that again next year. That's, that becomes a burden. We don't want to be a burden. We're just simply trying to level things out here, at least to some margin. Yeah. So flip that button on the slide up. That button? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Lee Kors, Chairman of the Board of the Trustees, good at, excuse me, good morning. It is still morning. Um, just fully want to support what Reggie just said. We will not be, uh, for lack of a better phrase, kicking people out because of finances. We made that commitment from our foundation back in the 60s. What I will say is the analysis that he showed you, a lot of information, sorry about that, it was a little bit overwhelming. At the end of the day, we have an asset to sell. That asset is the rooms and the apartments that we have. From a market rate standpoint, we have to remain competitive. We don't want to overprice our asset, our rooms, but we also don't want to underprice them. So one of the ways that we help maintain the ability to support you throughout your entire life is making sure that we're pricing the new rooms that are going to be moved into by somebody at the right price. Sorry. And the battery just died. No, it's just oh, oh, okay, it goes in and out. <laughs> so that's why we had to do that analysis, and the board fully supported that to be able to say, what should we be pricing our assets at? Just like eggs at the grocery store. You, there's got to be a price that you don't want to underprice it. You don't want to overprice it. So that's how we're planning in the long term, 20, 30, 50, 60, whatever years, the long term financial stability is by taking care of what we're able to sell, the rooms, pricing it at the right level for newcomers. That's that market price thing. But then also, we still have to manage our day-to-day -day operations, and that's where we had to do that analysis and the variance that Reggie talked about to make sure that we are pricing it, I'll use the word, appropriately. We don't want to underprice what you're paying for your room. We don't want to overprice what you're paying for a room, but we have to make sure that we balance that and, and work through that variance, not to take you up to market rate, because that's not the expectation. Yeah, see, everybody's going, okay, that's good. That's not the expectation of the board. That's not the challenge that we put in front of, of Reggie and Jack and the team. It's to price it appropriately so that we can take care of you throughout your entire life here at the Heart Center. Okay, now we'll go back to the next slide. Yeah, it's, we'll get a mic over to Pam. She is next. I'll have, I'm Thank sorry you. to tell you, that has to be our last question. We are at an hour from when we actually started the meeting. That's our original Pam, before I take your question, I just want to add to something that Lee said. And that is, yes, when we subsidize rents for individuals that have gotten to a point where they don't have the financial ability to fully pay their monthly rent, when we do that, that is at a cost to the organization. One of the first things I heard about when I got here, we need a better solution than that. Okay? And we've looked at what other organizations have done, and we looked at our own board meeting minutes going back 60 years. Way back 60 years ago, there was discussion about building a foundation for the Hearthstone, not, not the foundation of a building, a charitable foundation where you, other residents, incoming residents,
families of the quest, uh, outside organizations, outside individuals, wealthy individuals, that people can give money toward a foundation from which we would take the earnings of whatever assets we can build and use that money to subsidize residents. That process is closer to fruition than it ever has been. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a board member that joined us uh, a little less than a year ago, a gentleman named uh, Doug Custer. And Doug, in his work life, he deals with these kinds of things. And so he and I, along with two attorneys, we're in the final phases of drafting all the documents for that foundation. If that foundation goes live, then we can begin to promote our cause, and the general cause, the general purpose of that foundation is to subsidize resident um, assistance. That, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, Pam, what's your question? I hope that mic's on. Yeah. Yes, it's on, and if it weren't, I think most of us, this isn't that difficult. The reason I wanted to make a comment is that I didn't know if you, during the discussion about budget, have considered using any of the incredible expertise of the residents. We have people who have been college presidents, we have developers, we have owners of EPA firms, we have an incredibly gifted lot of people who are well educated, who have handled budgets in millions and millions of dollars in the corporations that they have headed. And I just thought it would be nice to know if you had considered using any of the available and remarkable talent that we have living here. Okay. And thank you for that question. And the answer is yes, that, that's on our agenda. Here, two, two caveats. One is, I cannot have any of you work for this organization. That, that's illegal. Okay. You're, a, you're a resident here, you're a tenant to a landlord, and it's not appropriate for you to do anything that even resembles work. However, so, so to that end, I can't substitute volunteer efforts uh, and not pay a staff person to do a thing that we need to do as an organization. We've got, we've got to be careful with that. But um, we have a wonderful lady, if you haven't met her, that works for our resident engagement team named Nancy. This is Linda. Linda. Yeah, somebody knows. Linda. Yeah, I helped interview her with Lance when she was hired months ago. Nancy has a tremendous background in developing volunteer groups. Um, she hasn't been able to get to that because we've been short of two full-time people in resident engagement. As I mentioned earlier, we've now closed that gap. We are fully staffed in resident engagement, and Lance has assured me Nancy will now turn to um, the use of and participation by residents with skills and talent and experience that can help us as an organization. Because I think one of the first things you'll see, I hope you'll pay attention in when this comes out, is a, a poll or a survey about how you feel like you could participate as a volunteer. Hopefully included in that is also some of the needs we have. Let's just say we'd like to have at least two hours a day someone, not the same person, but a person come in two hours and spend time in our memory care area, reading the newspaper, talking with people. We don't expect you to give care, but it's that additional contact. We all know what COVID did to us in terms of us losing contact with each other, with our families and friends. We know we have lots of ground to make up. Nowhere was the impact of that more evident than in memory care. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. We didn't consider it in our budgeting. If we, if we have a thing that needs to happen and somebody needs to do it, that has to be a paid individual. But in terms of Events, activities, uh, presentations, classes, uh, the general volunteering, absolutely, Pam. But that, that is our goal, to build a group of volunteers, not just of all of you and others, but to also try to bring in family members, bring in people from the outside that are willing to give up their time. And we're excited about what that will look like over the course of the year. So that, that is a part of resident engagement. Lance is already on it. I'm pretty sure Nancy will be the head of it. We're just waiting. Uh, to get the two new people signed up to play. So with that, I apologize. I know you have lots of questions. I want to thank you again for being here, for participating. I want to let you know we have recorded this event. That recording, hopefully, we have a new camera. Hopefully, it's a little better recording. 
that will be available on channel 370, um, and we'll let you know what times that it will air. It will also be available as a link on your computer on YouTube. Um, Lance will create that link later today. Hallie will send out um, uh, an email if you, if you allow us to send you emails. And you'll just be able to click on that link and watch it. And then you can go through it and pause it and if you want to take a look at some of the slides and stuff. So with that, we're adjourned. But thank you so much for being in and for participating.